Marangaria, Nadu, Yinjimar, Wurundjeri, Main, Wurundjeri, Nurembang. In my language, Wurundjeri, I want to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we are coming to you tonight. Well, how young is too young to be on social media? And we'll ask a government minister tonight why she took campaign contributions from Sportsbet. Joining our panel, tennis champion and broadcaster, Yelena Dokic, who's faced intense scrutiny online. Communications Minister and Member for Greenway, Michelle Rowland. Shadow Communications Minister and Member for Banks, David Coleman. Youth Advocate for Planned International Australia, Imogen Senior. And Presenter, 10 News First, Midday and Studio 10, Narelda Jacobs. Thank you. Um, can a minister uh, take money from a lobby group, uh, say the gambling sector, and still be trusted to make decisions in the interests of the community? I think she means you, Michelle Rowland. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question. And up front, I want to acknowledge that transparency and accountability is important to Australians. And Australians always expect better when it comes to this area, even when no rules have been broken. And I respect that, and I think that that is a reasonable position to hold. So do you, do you now say it was, it was wrong to take the, the, um, the money from Sportsbet, $19,000 in donations from Sportsbet? What I'm saying is whilst this was compliant with all the rules, I appreciate that there need to be different levels of accountability and that there's different and community views um, on this matter. But also, I think this highlights one very important aspect, and that is about disclosure of political donations. I think that this is an area of long overdue reform, and the Albanese government has had a long-held position, for example, of decreasing the disclosure threshold, so it is a lower amount that needs to be disclosed, but also having real-time reporting. And if this conversation encourages that to be sped up and we get results in that, then I think that is a good thing and I'll be participating in that discussion. If, if you feel that way now, why didn't you feel that way then when you were taking the 19,000 from Sportsbet? Well, my answer stands. And what I would also point out, because uh, you go to a very important question about how a minister's judged. Ministers and governments are judged on delivery. And myself in opposition and now in government, and the government itself once in opposition, has a very strong track record when it comes to the fundamental issue of where governments regulate in this area, and that's on harm minimisation. I would point out that the most fundamental change to the regulatory system, one that has been talked about since 2015, which is a national self-exclusion register, so people who are vulnerable with one touch can actually exclude themselves, will be proclaimed under me as minister. We are pushing ahead with this. And you didn't declare the donations that, it, that was exposed through Sportswet's financial uh, records. And so we don't know from the time that you were elected till now what decisions you've made based on that donation. So when you're talking about disclosure, you didn't disclose this and we don't know what decisions you have made uh, that have been influenced by that. So, you know, the issue of trust in who you are actually representing, are you representing Sportsbet or are you representing the community? I, I respect the question and all aspects of it and I'll answer them in turn. The first is that governments, as I said, are judged on their record. The disclosure rules, as they exist at any point in time, have always been complied with by myself, including disclosures to the Parliament and the Ministerial Code of Conduct. But you make an excellent point in terms of how are we to judge that. And I ask that you judge that on the evidence. The evidence is that we have had a strong track record on harm minimisation supporting the establishment of a national consumer protection framework. Next month, new advertising taglines come into place. I will be the minister responsible for turning on the first self-exclusion register that will apply nationally and apply to all of those platforms. But there's three other very important points that we have in the pipeline. And they've been talked about for a long time but not acted on. The first is in terms of credit card betting, um, which we are looking at very closely and which I will lead as Minister for reform in this area. Not only because the evidence is there, but we will uh, ensure that harm minimisation 
always remains paramount. The second is a long overdue response to the review of classification. Currently, there are games that have loot boxes or simulated like mm. gambling that are not regulated. And clearly, this is an area of concern can, can, for many parents and vulnerable can, can children. I just come and in, the... Can I just come in and just get a very quick answer to this question? I want to just go back to Rhonda very quickly and then go to the other panel. From now on, will you not accept money? from gambling companies? I will not take money from Sportsbet and I look forward from any, to the any outcomes. any gambling companies? I haven't taken, as I said... In the future? As I said, I'm now the Minister. I will not be taking okay. money from can, can Sportsbet. Can I ask, will you meet with the Gambling Reform Alliance? I understand that you've refused to meet with Peter Scott Costello. I, I, have, I have met with the Gambling okay. Reform Alliance and we had a very productive discussion about where they can fit into the regulatory regime to... and reform in this area. Uh, Rhonda, thanks for your question. I understand you're, you're a Greens councillor uh, as well from Dandenong, so, and this issue is, is very close yeah, to In my you, community, $150 million comes out of our community every year. We're the poorest um, LGA mm. in the state. Oh. Uh, that money is coming off the table of uh, literally of the children in our D area. David Coleman, the coalition as well took money from, from sports bet, over $100,000 at the last election as well. So if you're talking about a situation here, it could equally be yourself sitting where Michelle Rowland is, isn't it, if, you're, if your parties are taking money from gambling companies? Well, well the key... Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the, the key issue, Stan, is that everyone's got to um, comply with the rules and there are very detailed rules around uh, disclosure around funding for the political parties and uh, ministerial disclosures, as the minister uh, but mentioned. But that, that's, that's, that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about here potentially being compromised by big gambling that are putting money into political companies. Are you prepared to say right now, as Michelle Rowland said tonight, that you wouldn't be taking any future funds from, uh, from gambling companies? Well, we'll extend. I mean, we follow the rules. There's a review, actually, of the donation rules happening right now under the Joint Standing Committee on electoral matters. So you'd be happy up. taking money from sports bet? Well, well, Stan, I think what we should do is allow that committee <laughs> to do its, uh, do its reviews and it'll come back and make recommendations. And the government, uh, just to be clear, Stan, um, the government hasn't changed the laws. The minister's made a, a statement just here, but the, the laws are exactly the same today as they were yesterday. So the minister's basically saying that something that wasn't OK a few weeks ago for her is... Uh, is that was OK a few weeks ago is not OK today. I think the better way and the orderly way to do it is to say, let's look at the rules overall, which is what the committee is doing. It's then a matter for the government to say, what does the government think the law of Australia should be? And then the opposition um, will, will have a view. I think that's the way... I want to go to Elena Dokic. As someone who works in sports commentary, you've worked in sport as well, are you concerned about the increasing influence of sports gambling, sports gambling online companies particularly the advertising of sports gambling as well? Look, it's been something that we've talked about in tennis as well now for a couple of years, and especially in the last few years, there's been a lot. And I think for me, you know, those, I think, companies perhaps working with the governing bodies uh, to help... Um, you know, with players and with sports people as well, because there's been a lot. Players have, you know, um, thrown matches and a lot has happened. And uh, we've had actually quite a few players where they've gotten life bans, where they can't ever be in tennis again, not even work in tennis. And we've had that happen quite a bit over the last five years. And the governing bodies in tennis have done a lot to help players as well, because it's gotten to a point where, you know, there's been life threats if you don't do certain things and if you don't, um, you know, perform. Mm. Uh, the way that they want you to, and, and it, there's, it's just gotten, it got really messy and it got really dangerous. So I think it's more about, I think from a, I'm looking at it from a sports person's perspective, and I was in the sport for a very long time, and, and while a lot of that was going on, I think it's about the safety at the end of the day of sports people and athletes, and how can maybe those companies actually work with athletes, with the governing bodies in certain countries, but also our worldwide governing bodies, mm. the WTA and the ATP, to actually prevent a lot of this happening. Elena, how did you first become aware of the online trolling that you were experiencing and what impact did it have on you both personally and professionally and what more do you think could be done? Yeah, thank you for your question. It's such an important one and something that I've now been kind of fi uh, fighting publicly for the last two or three years. 
and uh, it's um, it's not an easy topic to talk about because I think ultimately what we're trying to do is just go out there, go about our day, uh, you know, do our job. We are, you know, in the public eye and being public figures, uh, but that shouldn't stop us from, you know, having an Instagram account and having it open. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm not out here hurting anyone. I'm just actually, in fact, the opposite. I'm trying to do something good with my platform and create a safe space and a community as well. And then, um, you know, you do get a bit of this hate and you get trolling and I've had it from everything from, you know, mental health perspective to body shaming, uh, you know, to abuse as well. And I, I consider myself to be pretty strong, I think, mm. and, and I've got pretty thick skin, but to actually read some of those things to, you know, um, when it comes to, you know, are you going to try and kill yourself again with a laughing emoji, which is what happened this year. Mm. And I'm not the only one that gets put mm. through this. So yeah, it's been something that I'm actually so passionate about. Mm. And I've had people close to me that actually really care about me go, you know, don't read that stuff or, you know, some people mm. have said, oh, well, you know, you put yourself out there on the social media, that's to be expected. It's not, actually. Why is it normal to be abused? Right. If we had it in real life, people wouldn't be able to get away yeah. with it. If I was on a tennis court on, on centre court in the middle of the Australian mm. Open and someone was, you know, screaming out and insulting me, they would get taken mm. away, right, by security, and there would be consequences. So I think the question is, why are there no consequences when it actually comes to social well, media? And just one more thing, they, they have no idea actually how much damage they are doing. I've during this summer, I've actually called it evil, and I really stand behind that. And um, yeah. and why I say that is because actually people's lives are at stake. You have no idea how many people I had just walking through the grounds of the Australian Open, going to you know my next match uh, to commentate and do my work, come to me and say, or even write to me actually on social media and say. You know, thank you so much for actually tackling this because, um, you know, my brother took his life 24 hours ago and we were at his funeral. Mm. And then you read these comments and it was breaking my heart um, to actually hear this. But I, I actually know that that's how it works because there's so many people suffering. Nine, nine Australians, just in Australia alone, every single day, take their life. That's almost three and a half thousand people a year and almost a million people worldwide and then someone is out there actually joking about it you don't know what kind of a damage it can do to me or to someone else they might take their life because of that there needs to be more accountability responsibility maybe you know it's not going to help to uh, have a verified account where you have to give your details your driver's license and actually prove who you are to actually open an account but i, I certainly think it's something mm. to try because the accounts that i've gotten abuse from 90 mm. percent of them were private accounts um, no picture like mm. you said no followers anonymous but also as soon as i called them out this year and mm. i didn't even put their accounts up i was I thought I'd be, you know, take the the higher ground here, be the nice person, even though people wanted me to. Um, they actually went and they deleted it straight mm -hmm. away. They went and deleted all of those comments because you called them out. By being silent, they actually have the control. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's really important to really fight. Well done. Mm -hmm. it, it, it does... Yeah. Thank you, Yelena. I'll bring in the two politicians here as well, because are we talking about a need for greater regulation here? Does it go as far as the previous questioner put, and that is actually ha forcing people to be identified? What can you do, Michelle Rowland? Well, firstly, uh, Yelena said she's a fighter, but I think it's important to note that she shouldn't be left to fight alone. Um, there is a role for civil society, for governments, um, for regulation um, in this area as well. And it's fortunate in Australia that we have uh, a leading agency in the eSafety Commissioner that actually does have powers under the Online Safety Act to listen to complaints, take complaints, to take down posts and even unmask people, go behind that anonymity um, where it's required to carry out the act. By this stage, Issue. so much of the damage is done. Yeah, it's Absolutely. done. But also, I've done this, by the way. I'm not on Twitter. Mm. I'm on Instagram. I've done this. Mm. I've reported it. Um, I've even, even blocked some people. There is no action, by the way. I looked at it a week later. Those posts mm. were not taken down. Right? So nothing is actually done, right? 
I called them out. All of them got taken off. But why this... Why, my question in general is not to you, but just in general. Why can someone write something that damaging? Um, I'm not going to repeat those things again mm. or, you know... Mm. But there is no filter. That stays there. And mm. let's think about this as well. What message are we sending to the younger generation that this is OK? Yeah. Can, can, well, can I...? Sorry. Well, yes. certainly, right. certainly it's not... OK. Um, we do have a cyberbullying scheme for children and an adult cyber abuse scheme that takes thousands of cases and complaints and that are dealt with by investigators at eSafety. Mm. Um, this is an aspect of the law. It's barely a year old and we're betting down as a government a lot of those implementation points in the Act. But I think one of the most important things I take away, Elena, from what you're saying is that we need to... People need to report this. Um, we have an e-safety commissioner. Unfortunately, not enough people know that it is there, that it has these resources and that it has these powers. And there's also interaction between the e-safety commissioner and the platforms. And platforms acting on their own are often not incentivised um, to act quickly. Yeah. And that's why we have these regulations yeah, Stan, in place. Stan, look, I think the really fundamental point here is that the social media companies um, don't care a great deal about online safety. That's the reality. And as a consequence, in Australia, we've had to take some, you know, very strong regulatory action. So the Minister mentioned the eSafety Commission that we set up in 2015. Um, uh, Cyberbullying uh, regulations will be taken down with, for kids. Cyber abuse for adults, which just came in in the Online Safety Act. Uh, a year or so ago. But the fundamental problem here is um, the social media companies show a thuggish disregard for the mental health of Australians. Mm. And so what that means is, as a government, you need to lean forward. And the social media companies... Are well, you, very... had a, you had a long time in government to lean well, and forward. We did. And, and we did, Stan. And we did. The, I mean, the eSafety Commissioner, there is nothing else in the world like the eSafety Commissioner. And, of course, like, and to Elena's point... Um, we have, have is every single awful thing that happens online removed? No, of course not. No one's suggesting that. We'd love to get to that point, but the eSafety Commissioner has clearly been very valuable. But I think the um, the really important point here, Stan, is that um, the social media companies are very sophisticated. They're very smart. They're very good at sort of moving the ball down and coming up with uh, plausible sounding reasons as to why not much should happen. And that's why regulatory action is important. We did, and there's some other things that we should We did talk ask about some too. of those companies to appear tonight, but um, mm. they're mm. not here, perhaps mm. another time. Can I just put a quick question um, to Narelda and Imogen as well? Mm. It's something that occurs to me, I hear it from other people as well. Why stay on it? Because it's a beautiful place. <laughs> it is actually a beautiful place. Instagram is a beautiful place. You still get some nasty messages um, on Instagram. And, you know, here I am on Valentine's Day with love in my heart, um, mostly for myself. Um, and, <laughs> then, and then there's someone who's tagged me in a comment. Um, Burn in hell. Hell is waiting. You know, and so... I felt really sad after reading that because, mm. you know, it's Valentine's Day. But, you know, it's... For the most part, Instagram is a really beautiful place. It's an empowering place. Twitter? Um, it's where I started out with social media and in a big way, sharing all of myself, giving so much of myself, like you do as well, Yelena. You've created a safe space for people to come and, uh, and feel empowered and supported. Um, and you find a community there. Mm. Yeah, and I don't think... When you go, well, why stay on it? Mm. Uh, you know, why should we succumb to people that mm. are doing yeah. something and that is so not OK? Something yeah. that is and, not and right. It is a community, isn't it, too? Yeah. yeah, and I think there are amazing things that social media is able to offer yeah. us. I think I find incredible resources um, <laughs> around queer history and um, queer education mm. that I wouldn't have access to otherwise. Yep. I think I have amazing communities of political opinions and mutual aid that I'm able to access, and I think that's incredible. And asking women just to log off, which is one of the most popular comments I've seen when we're talking about this, on Twitter especially, is asking women to remove themselves from another aspect of public mm. life. Yeah, and especially... <laughs> 
think that comment mainly goes to also people in the public eye or that mm. have a platform. It's like, well, you are in the media, you kind of have to expect expect that. But no, why? No, you don't. Why yeah. do you have to expect it if you yeah. are? You know, it doesn't just and go for us. Much more famous people it, than us, and, and singers and athletes in the world. Why is that normal? Because you are in the public eye, that it's normal to be abused. Yeah, I actually really, yeah, I actually well, really try to use. We're my, going to, um, yeah. So, I sorry, actually, sorry, I actually really try to use mine for something good. People come, mm. and especially women, to maybe get a bit of motivation, help. I've gotten it from other people yeah. as well. So why can't we create this beautiful co community and mm. safe space, which is what a lot of us are trying to do, without actually being abused? Well, tonight's discussion has raised any issues for you or anyone you know. Of course, you can contact Lifeline, Kids Helpline, or 13 Yarn. You can see the numbers there on your screen. This is a question to David Coleman. Uh, your party's leader infamously walked out of the parliament during the apology to Indigenous peoples in 2008. And currently the federal Liberal Party seems to be deliberately playing a dead hand when it comes to the vote to, par to the voice to parliament. Now it might seem like this is a clever strategy in the party room, David, but to the rest of us out here in the real world, we see it for what it is. It's just a lack of moral courage and a willingness to play political games at the expense of our nation. And the question I have for you is when would you and your colleagues realise that there are some issues so important to our nation that doing nothing is never an option? Well, thank, thank you for your question, and obviously I completely reject the, the premise of the question. So, so here's the situation. So we have a proposal from the government uh, for The Voice. Now, what we've said as an opposition is we've got a whole series of questions about that, and we'd like them to be answered. And what the government's basically saying is they're not going to be answered. And, you sh and frankly, the government's effectively saying you shouldn't be asking because we'll deal with that later. Now, that's one approach. That's the government's approach. I think it's completely wrong. And to be frank, I think it is disrespectful to the Australian community to be unwilling to engage in a sensible, mature and calm discussion about the details of the voice. What, why should the opposition, or for, or for that matter, matter any Australian, not be allowed to ask questions about the voice? The, the Prime Minister said in Parliament the other day. I, I, don't, think, I the... don't think there's any shortage of questions. Well, Peter no, Dutton's the... had access to the, uh, the, the... To, the, to the advisory committees. He's had access to all not, of the, the, the reports. Questions... He's asking a lot of questions. Well, and so he should stand, because it's, it's not a trivial thing to change the Constitution. We've done it eight times in 122 years. And Mr Dutton absolutely appropriately is asking questions about, well, how's it going to work? How's this body going to be elected? And so on. And the Prime Minister in Parliament a few weeks ago said words to the effect of, um, you know, have a heart, support the voice, words to that effect, I'm paraphrasing, which effectively implies that if one doesn't support the voice or is asking questions about the voice, that that person doesn't have a heart. And that is absurd, because we all want the best for Indigenous Australians. We all acknowledge that there's been... Things in our history um, have been that have been terrible towards Indigenous Australians. But to presuppose that unless you adopt the exact methodology of the Prime Minister in relation to The Voice, that you are morally inferior simply for asking questions. I think it's completely wrong. I don't think the mainstream Australian community is going to accept that approach. And I think that Mr Dutton is absolutely right to be asking the questions that he's asking. I think, I think it's not an issue of having a heart. It's an issue of having a ticker. Um, and I think, I think the Australian public and First Nations people in this country are being disrespected the longer the Liberal Party hold out on declaring their hand on The Voice. Uh, it's, it's one thing for Peter Dutton to come out and apologise for not being there for the, for the national apology uh, because he recognised that he was on the wrong side of history at that time. What is he going to say the day after the referendum when the Australian public uh, overwhelmingly support First Nations people wanting to have a voice. Where, where do you sit, David? Do you support 
the voice or not? Look, I support the position that we've adopted as a shadow cabinet, which is to but, work but, through... but others in your party, Andrew Bragg has supported it, Julian Lisa has supported it, others have come out and said that yeah, they no, support it. I, I like, like many of us in our party, I I'm, want to hear more answers from the government and I think we'll go through that process. Um, I, I don't think that it, it should be a case that this must be resolved tomorrow. I think it is more important... Well, it's that not being resolved tomorrow. It's the well, date hasn't been set for the referendum. No, no, it's going to be I'm, months I'm, and months I'm, away. The, the, the campaigns haven't even started yet. Sure, sure. It's, it's a rhetorical... Like, I just mean quickly. I think that what should happen is that there should be a sensible, well-informed, um, orderly discussion. I think that Mr Albanese should address each of the questions that Mr Dutton has asked. And... People can then form their view. And, and oh. I just don't... It's, 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 I find it very odd that the argument is that Mr Dutton should not be asking questions. The questions are a diversionary tactic. No, they're not. To stall for time... No, they're not. ...until Peter Dutton can see that it's a popular thing in Australia. So... He is playing politics I, with the voice just, of parliament. He's playing politics with the voice I, of parliament. It is... It is an in-principle question that's being posed to, to the people, which will then be determined... The detail will be determined by by parliamentarians uh, in legislation that will follow this in-principle support of a voice to Parliament. What Peter Dutton is doing is stalling for time to see whether it is popular amongst the people. We know that it's popular amongst Australians. He needs to stand for something and be on the right side of history and so he can be judged accordingly. It's, it's like some people in, in politics are enjoying the drama of it. You know, they, they want the politics of it. It is like watching... A a very bad heteronormative rom-com <laughs> where, where there is the tension, you know, there's, yeah. there's one, one side saying, this, look, this is good for us, the other side saying, but I don't know you very well. And then, but the thing is, is that the Liberal Party dis started this. Um, Noel Pearson said this today, and, uh, the Liberal Party started this, the, the Howard government started, started this, uh, the Malcolm Fraser government started this. In the late 70s, some of us remember the, the road to, to Makarata even then. This is not something that the Liberal Party should not be taking ownership of. The Liberal Party started this. Finish what you started. And, uh, just, just, just really quickly, yeah. David. Yeah. Just really quickly, because yeah. we do have a final question to finish on. Would you support a conscience vote when it came to it, rather than being well, bound again, to any we'll, party? We'll, walk, we'll work through that in shadow cabinet of the party room, and I'm not going to you know, okay. preempt that process. Stan, my question's a simple one. It's initially directed towards you, actually. Um, <laughs> why do we only, uh, or mainly, speak English in Australia? Why aren't we all taught to speak our local Indigenous language too? Thank you very much. Um, Narelda? Mm. I begin and end uh, my bulletins with Kaya, which is my uh, Nyunga language for hello, and Buddha, which is we'll see you again soon. You know, And uh, I think it's just a really beautiful way. Children are learning that on Nyunga country, where I come from, children learn that. C children come home and tell their... You know, s hear me say that... Um, on the bulletin and, and, uh, and tell their family. She's saying hello, you know, because children are learning that at schools. And, but it's a school-by-school school basis, isn't it? It's not a curriculum thing. It's, it's the goodwill of the school. What... what, what yeah, 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 I think... Look, I, I, I know that we've got politics here. and I, I, I'm not from that, and I, I certainly don't know anything about it. I think I come from a bit of a different space where I... Maybe, again, I'm naive, but I, I just want everyone to get along, and I've, I'm... You know, I was a refugee twice. I know what things like this can cause. Um, and we've seen wars over the years. We've got a massive one still on at the moment where tens of millions of people are refugees. I think ultimately everyone needs to get around, I think, just a different mindset in society. Why can't we get along and respect other cultures and other people. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to learn some words. Womenjika, is that correct? Did uh, I say yeah. that right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, from, you know, from, from this language yeah, of this country. Absolutely. Welcome. So, and, and I come from a different culture. I, w I was not born in Australia. I came here when I was 11. I think you learn and I try to respect other cultures as well. I think in general, this is what we need to have as a society. If we don't, it mm. leads to wars. It, it leads to us being divided in this world. And we're in 2023. We shouldn't be having these discussions about that. Indeed. Thank you so much for your question. Mm. That's, uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you again to our panel, Yelena Dockich, Michelle Rowland, David Coleman, Imogen Senior and Narelta Jacobs.
And thank you for sharing your stories and questions as well. Next week, I'll be with you live from Sydney. Joining me, Ukrainian ambassador to Australia, Vasil Miroshenko, also US Senator Sarah McBride and professor at ANU's National Security College, George Brandis. You can head to our website to register to be in the audience for that. It's got to be a timely discussion, of course, looking at the conflict of, between Russia and Ukraine. One year on, and we've learned tonight, US President Joe Biden has made a surprise visit to Kiev as well. So, in my language, marang niang, that means good night and mandangur. Thank you.